this is the Black Fathers podcast series, which is a collection of 12 videos covering a spectrum of intricately connected topics related to Black fatherhood. I am Dr. Alvin Thomas, Assistant Professor in the School of Human Ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Our identity is an interaction of the various experiences, values, contexts, and roles that make up our individual existence. It defines our personalities and our limits. Today, we will explore the intersecting identities of being a man, a parent, and Black. In some ways, being a man can be considered advantageous and privileged. Yet, when you intersect masculine identity with Black identity, privilege soon becomes risk. Other intersecting identities like parenthood can further complicate the roles and expectations of Black fathers. Joining me to discuss today's episode of uh, the Black Fathers series, that's the intersecting identities, are author, activist, and educator, Mr. Tony Porter, uh, public health leader, family advocate, and occasional poet, Mr. D Mr. Dwayne Curry, and associate professor and director of the NC State Whole Dad Lab, Dr. Kiana Cryer Coopet. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Yes, okay. thank you. So let's start. If, uh, I'd like each of you to take, a, take a, a, a moment to just say a little bit more about the work that you do, specifically its relevance to Black fathers. Mr. Curry, go ahead. You could go ahead first. Sure. So, so I'll go first. So I, I create and I manage grants um, at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The grants that aim to support uh, families raising thriving children beginning at the earliest, earliest ages. Um, I also, I'm a, I'm a podcaster with my wife, um, myself, and a, an occasional poet where I often lift up issues such as uh, being a Black man in America, being a father, and how that all intersects in just being a person and impacts how we make decisions and how we live our life. And uh, for me, again, what's most important is the fact that I, I am a father. I'm a father of four in, in, a, in a blended family. Um, so I'll start with that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Dr. Cooper, Dr. Dr. Cryer Coupet, go ahead. Good morning. Again, I'm uh, Kiana Cryer Coupe, and I'm an associate professor in the School of Social Work at North Carolina State University. And there I run the NC State Whole Dad Lab. And when thinking about this concept of whole, I really chose that moniker for the lab because I felt like a lot of the fatherhood research focused on deficits. So father's absence, things that are not working well. And we know that fathers show up as whole people. So people who have things connected to their well-being. They have issues related to lifestyle. We know that, you know, dads really are an important factor when we think about the academic, the social, as well as the financial health of their children. And so when focusing my work on black fathers, I really want to be able to investigate the whole man, um, the whole person, and not really just focus on the deficits that we see in the media. And so I was born and raised in a family where my father was present and active, but I had several uncles who fathered in many different ways. And so I don't see fatherhood as being one vision of what a man or what father means. I've seen many and like to showcase that in my research. Thank you so much, Dr. Coupe. Uh, doc, uh, Mr. Porter, go right ahead. Yes, uh, so I'm Tony Porter. I'm Tony Porter. I'm the CEO of A Call to Men. We're a national organization and, and our primary focus is on promoting healthy, respectful manhood. We believe that as we promote healthy, respectful manhood, we also decrease violence against women and girls. And we live in a society that has an epidemic of violence against women and girls. We do this through an intersectional lens, which makes the work of uh, working with black and brown men, financially poor men, uh, just very, very important to our work. I'm also a father of six, I have three boys and three girls. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Porter. Looking forward to this really awesome discussion. Um, so to, to, to get us started, I'd like to direct this first question uh, to Mr. Porter and Mr. Curry. What is a man? What, what are the qualities of manliness and uh, is it different from what we generally consider to be masculinity? Mr. Curry, would you like to go first? Sure, sure. I, I'll jump in first. So, you know, I, I think 
what society deems as masculine and manliness is, is not an accurate depiction of, of what it is. Yeah, I, I think it's it when you think of social media, um, society presents this this macho, uh, I'm in control, I don't need to express my feelings type of person as what a man is. And that's something that most can't escape. It's on TV, it's on uh, the radio, it's on movies, it's, it's what we see in every day. And social media is it's flooded with uh, many of those uh, people trying to portray that that type of person when often it's it's it leaves people unhappy and and, and it's, un, it's it's an authentic representation of of what a man is and for me so what I see as a man is is someone who's true to his word and what he says what he does and who he is is all the same so I think of integrity when I think of what a man is and what manlyhood is. Hmm. So I, I so appreciate so much of what uh, Brother Curry shared. Uh, society teaches us uh, this, what we call a collective socialization of manhood, that men are supposed to be tough, strong, athletic, aggressive, dominating, always in control, don't be vulnerable, don't ask for help, offer help, accept help, uh, you know, be a protector. You gotta always be strong, show no fear, show no weakness. And specifically, to define what it means to be a man by distancing ourselves from the experience of women and girls. Mm -hmm. That's what society teaches. Uh, and it's tripping us up as men. Uh, we're having a lot of problem trying to hold on to these rigid notions of manhood. So like Brother Curry, I believe that to be a man is really simply to be a person, uh, to be your authentic self, to be loving, to be kind, to be gentle, to be nurturing, to be vulnerable, to ask for help, to offer help, to accept help, to share a full range of feelings and emotions, not just anger, as this collective socialization teaches us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jess. A, a lot to, 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 to ponder on. And I think it sets the foundation for um, some of the other things that are going to probably hopefully come up. Uh, in this discussion. Uh, Dr. Kriya Coupe, I know, I, I can imagine just kind of thinking of the work and knowing some of the work that comes out of your lab, I could imagine that this question of what is a man and what is manliness and does it jive with what we think of as masculinity, that that's a question that comes up quite a bit in your research, if, if you could talk about it a little bit. Yeah, so I think that we've seen um, in the fatherhood research landscape that the definition has shifted over time in terms of how we think about masculinity. And so similar to what Mr. Porter said and also highlighting what Mr. Curry had to say, um, really kind of thinking about this rigid or hegemonic masculinity, we know that that has been at the forefront. And I would say within the last 10 to 15 years, we're starting to see scholars really hone in on different types of masculinities. And so not just focusing on the masculinity, like, so this is not a monolith. There are very many ways of knowing and many different ways of being. Um, and so that has come out and it's been interesting in my work. A lot of times we are doing qualitative interviews with fathers, uh, specifically non-resident fathers, and to hear men to talk about the different portions or facets of their life that contribute to how they see themselves as masculine or how they see themselves as a man. Um, it's been refreshing for me to hear many different versions. And so this idea of vulnerability is one that has come out a lot recently um, in my work in terms of thinking of men who are help seeking. So dads who you know need support and want support um, and that's coming from many different facets. So be that some type of peer support group or an online kind of social media support group. Um, I think that there are many ways of knowing, many ways of being. And I think the literature is finally starting to, to catch up with the experience um, of men across the board. Thank you so much. Um, so do you see any difference in what that looks like, what th those definitions look like for, I think you, you, you mentioned non-resident fathers, that's fathers who don't live in the home with their children. Mm -hmm. Do you see any difference for those fathers compared to fathers who live in the home with, with, with their children? Yeah, then I talk to my husband about this a lot, actually. I think this idea of what it means to be a father um, mm -hmm. shifts based on those two different dynamics. And so when you see a dad out in the street with his small children, men are often applauded like, oh, you know, you're doing it. It's going very well. 
when for many, that really is your everyday experience. Like you wake up in the morning, you're bathing the kids, you're feeding the kids, you're doing homework, you're doing those things. Um, and I think the stigma related to that might be more um, piercing for non-resident fathers because there's always already the expectation that you don't do these things as a dad, that these are the mom's jobs or the mom's roles. Now you don't live in the household. So when you, someone does see you do it, it's like, ah, when in many cases, um, Professor Waldo Johnson at the University of Chicago talks about this a lot, that when we think about black families, we know that for a long time, we've had families that don't live in the same household, but dads do show up in ways that those who live in the household might. So, you know, say a mom is living at home with her mother, like the dad can come over for dinner time. We're having dinner. You're participating in child rearing activities, even though it's not necessarily in that, that same household. So I do think to answer your question that the stigmas are different in terms of what the roles of fathers are um, based on residential status. And it also differs, again, as we think about what the responsibilities look like. And I feel like non-resident fathers sometimes get the short end of that stick. Thank you very much for, for kind of helping clear some of that up for us. Uh, I'm going to poke a little bit into your business, Dwayne, uh, Mr. Curry. Um, I, I, you, you mentioned at the beginning uh, being part of a blended family. And so now I'm thinking, OK, so Dr. Coupe, Kriya, Kriya Coupe just uh, helped us understand what that looks like for non-resident versus resident fathers. How, maybe in your own experiences, how has it looked uh, with regard to blended families? Yeah, so it's everything she said is completely in line with what I've seen personally and, and with others, with colleagues, with friends. And for me, so I have a blended family where, you know, I, I, my, uh, my stepson is seven years old. I have a stepdaughter who's nine year, years old. I have a son who's eight and my wife and I have a, a son together that's two. So, you know, we're, you know, modern day Brady Bunch, <laughs> if, if, if you'll say. Um, but it, it is it is difficult in a sense of just everyday activities of me just being present in, in, in my kids' lives and, 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 and being there, say on social media or posting up experiences, like she said, it's, it's so shocking to, to, to the social world. Where it's just things that I'm doing in everyday life, but it's like, oh wow, that's a black man who's actually caring for his kid. That's a black man who's changing diapers. And, and so it's it for me as someone who, who's very involved with my kids' lives, it's 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 somewhat of it, it's mind-boggling in, in a sense of uh, just because of the color of my skin, what I do is 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 it seems alien to 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 many. And and so it's 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 often what many fathers do who are black, but it's just, it's taken a lot, a lot of time, a lot longer than expected to truly recognize us and, and how we show up in our families. So I'm, I'm going to bring up something that was recently in the news, um, dads on duty. Um, and just wanted to, to, to get some of your reactions to that, because kind of what you're saying in, in, in your conversations is, that you have black fathers who are who have always been doing this work, who have always been fathering and parenting, and it almost seems a little bit like a bit of a tokenization when black fathers are when people finally open their eyes and see, oh great, they they are black fathers, or there is this one black father that I saw, but the 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 understand the 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 connotation is that that black father that I saw is the exception rather than the rule. And so we celebrate him uh, in inordinate ways when we see him doing something that is uh, tantamount to normal for black fathers, uh, but not seen as normal for black fathers. Um, so the, the news reports were, were pointing out this group that just recently started uh, in a specific state specific school that was having some violence issues. And the fathers decided to come out um, and support the school and to support their kids in school to try to reduce the violence and make the school a little bit more um, conducive to learning, a little bit safer for their kids and for the other kids in general. Um, what, what, what were your thoughts ab ab about that, um, that development or that, that, that news piece? I, I don't know if we could start with you, Tony. Well, what you make me think of, Doc, is, you know, we we live in a society that's a race construct. I mean, for us, that's a given. For some other folks, they're still struggling with that notion. Uh, within this race construct, uh, 
you know, we deal, we, we, we can include in that uh, white supremacy culture that's a part of this race contract. And what people though tend to try to at least neglect is the role that anti-blackness plays in all of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, an anti-Blackness contributes to all of the negative stereotypes that uh, we witness uh, as it relates to Black people, Brown people too, but specifically to Black people. You know, there's a unique relationship with Black people and, and this notion of anti-Blackness. And so, like yourself, on one hand, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see the images of the fathers in the school, uh, fighting and, and them being there really kind of fights back against these notions and these stereotypes of who we are in our family and communities. And then at the same time, though, the media will promote it like it's unique and, and we know it's not unique. So I'm, I'm, on one hand, I'm happy because it, you know, tends to push back against the stereotypes. But then again, it is tokenism and, it, and, it, and it's portrayed as if we're doing something special and unique. And, and this is the way we operate in, in general. Thank you very much, Tom, for that. Yeah, and I, I completely agree. If I can jump in very quickly, it's, it's I, I was glad to see that, to see fathers being elevated in that way and then binding together, create that community to, to change their surroundings and to have an impact. But then to, to what, what Mr. Porter just said, it's, it's you're thinking about one individual Mm -hmm. uh, situation where that's great, but what we need is we need the elevation of multiple situations to then change the narrative, the, to then change the mindsets. So, so like I, I see it as as more of a domino effect where that story was amazing. It moved me, and and I saw it tons of times, and I'm like, this is great. Hopefully, this is something that we can see more in the media of of elevating these types of stories as opposed to here's just one story and then that's it. Yeah, yeah, thanks. And I would say I was particularly struck by the story because when you think about the timeline, when they kind of highlighted the events that were occurring in the school and then they made it seem like it was just magic, this group of dads showed up overnight. Mm -hmm. We know that in the community, these assets already existed. For those dads to be able to organize that quickly and that well in terms of how they got in and had the strategy behind their action the infrastructure was already in place and so i would also just like to piggyback on the point that these things are not deficit in the community it's not that the dads didn't exist but now that they had the resources and that the window opened for them to be able to be in that school in that way um, highlighting the fact that there are community assets that can support father involvement in ways that work best for our youth i think are very important Thank you so much for that, um, all of you. I think the underlying message from, from, from that conversation is that Black dads have always been on duty. We, we, we appreciate this, this, this momentary highlighting, but we, we, we need the limelight to be shone on the work that Black dads have always been doing and will continue to do even beyond this. Um, so uh, we understand um, that, uh, so I'm kind of going to kind of refocus over to you, Tony. Uh, so there's been decades of work that has focused on eliminating violence against women. And I know you mentioned it a little bit uh, in, the, in the beginning as you talked about your work. Still though, this issue of violence against women remains a, ma a major issue. Uh, Tony, is this one of the areas that you, I know this is one of the areas that you specifically focus on in educating men, but how do we center and celebrate the basic humanity of men? And how do we do this without falling into unhealthy masculinity? That tension between those two pieces. You know, celebrating the humanity of men, that, that's an interesting question because for me, celebrating the humanity of men is really celebrating the humanity of people. Mm. I, I have a tendency to believe that uh, with all the oppression that women experience in our society, they, they're, they're, uh, they're better or closer or I'm trying to be conscious of how I say this. They represent humanity in a way that we as men continue to struggle with. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in defining what it means to be a man in doing such, 
this collective socialization of manhood, we distance ourselves from the experience of women and girls to define what it means to be a man. Uh, and so in essence, we distance ourselves from our own humanity in many respects. These rigid notions of manhood, you know, put us in this space, we call it the man box that are called to men, where we're much more of a role self than a whole self. Uh, and, and by distancing ourselves from the experience of women and girls to define what it means to be a man, it, it does two things. It creates this, it, it supports this epidemic of violence against women and girls because to distance yourself, you have to develop a lack of interest. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't care about women in our circle and our families, et cetera. Of course we do. But to distance yourself effectively, you cannot have interest in the experience of women and girls. Uh, uh, the doctor can, can tell us that an average women's studies course in a college, uh, you would rarely have more than 10% of the students be male identified right because we have a limited interest in the experience of women and girls and far too often for our boys that's outside of sexual conquest right and 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 so we're distancing ourselves from our own humanity is developing this limited interest in the experience of women and girls which contributes to why so many of us remain silent when violence is being perpetrated against women and girls we don't perpetrate the violence that's a minority of men but we're silent to the violence and then on the other side of it, by distancing ourselves, we're, we're, it, it makes it very difficult for men to embrace their, 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 their true authentic selves, right? Authenticity is difficult for us as men. And humanity is very difficult to embrace if you're not embracing authenticity. And so for, for me, as men, we can learn many lessons from women uh, in, in all the struggles they have in our society, they are just much more authentic, uh, whether it's sharing their experiences, their, their feelings, their emotions, their, their, their level of uh, emotional intellect, uh, all, all, of, all of these, the, the way they gather around each other, the way they gather around our community. I don't want to shortchange us as men. I know we're out there holding it down as well, but there's so much more for us. Uh, if we can stop defining what it means to be a man, stop teaching boys that what it means to be a man is to distance yourself from the experience of women and girls. Hmm. I like what you said about the role self versus the whole self. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I don't know if you could say a little bit more about that. Well, the, the role self is this, as, as we, we've all shared earlier, we, we call it the man box. Be tough, be strong, be athletic, be courageous. You know, you got to hold it down, handle your business. Don't share feelings with the exception of emotion. Don't show, don't share emotions with the exception of anger. Show no fear. You can't talk about pain. You can't talk about hurt feelings. Uh, you, you can see it in our boys. You know, you go to the average 16 year old boy who's looking a little twisted up, something's wrong, not feeling well. And you say, John, what's wrong? Or how you doing? His most immediate response is, I'm good, right? Our, our boys are, are, are taught that they have to handle their business on their own. And this, this is, and this extends, to, and I'm not just talking about black boys, but there's a unique experience with our boys and in, in how we define masculinity and how they're supposed to show up. And, the whole notion of being a grown man, right? You hear that in our communities, I'm a grown man. Well, a grown man is a lone man, right? Because all you're really doing is isolating yourself. Yeah. And, and we teach it to our son, sons very early on. So that's that whole, the difference for us in being, you know, when you're a role self, you're kind of just on remote control, doing tradition. Mm -hmm. Your whole self, is you're, you're embracing all the complexities and you're not running away from our own humanity when we're in that, when, and we do that when we run away from the experience of women and girls. You just give us a lot to chew on. I don't know if, if uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Curry or Dr. Coupe wants to jump in on that. Yeah, 
I just wanted to highlight that I think it starts very early. So your points about you know, being a grown man. We know that in our community, it starts early with even monikers like little man, like calling young boys little man. So the socialization or the indoctrinization of those roles starts very early. Um, and I think we can see it. I, for disclosure, have three kids, uh, two sons and a daughter, and my five-year-old son likes to play with dolls. And that bothers people in our family. Um, and they would say like, oh, we'll get him some action figures. And I say, well, no, he wants to, you know, pet his little doll and put it to sleep. These are things if he decides to father later on in his life, mm -hmm. he needs to know how to do. And so starting to practicing, practice those nurturing skills early on, don't stifle those things. And so I think that if we get to a point as a community where we can be comfortable having those conversations and comfortable allowing people to be themselves um, across a variety of domains, we'll find ourselves in a, in a better space. Mr. Curry, I see you were, you were jumping at the bit for that one. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I just, I, I, what you both said resonates with me so much. And, and what you said earlier, which serves as a key component, in my opinion, for this is vulnerability and, and how that there's, there's so much strength in being able to express and handle our emotions and our feelings. And, and how, when you do that, especially amongst men, amongst fathers, that creates community. And sometimes what gets us through today is just understanding and knowing that there are other people that may have experienced what we're experiencing or, or they're going through it themselves. And so, yeah, I, I think of a conversation that I had with my brother-in-law um, not that long ago when we were talking about vulnerability and masculinity. And one of the things that, that he said that we were diving into is that if you're, if you're walking around and if somebody breaks their arm, they're going to scream and they're gonna, you're going to see that pain in them. And it's okay if somebody sees somebody with a broken arm, they're not going to say, why are you screaming? Why are you yelling? And in the same way, if people are broken emotionally, if people are broken mentally, why then can they not yell in that same way? Why can they not express themselves in that same way? And so I think with men, with fathers, um, especially with, with Black men and Black fathers, that's be, being vulnerable and being able to be comfortable in, 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 as what was said, in expressing your true self and who you are. That's the true strength right there. Oh, you're muted, you're muted. Thank you all of you for that. Um, I, I thought my, my, I have another, an external mic here and I was wondering whether that was still working. It may not be working, so we'll see what happens. Um, <clears throat> I might need to adjust my camera as well. I see some rays of sunshine kind of going crazy over here. So as I was listening to, uh, to Brother Curry, it brought me back to a story. My two youngest, Kendall and Jay, they're about a, a year and a half apart. And uh, there was some concern about possibility of uh, someone stalking children in the community I lived in at the time. And I sh so I, I pulled them both to the side and I have a conversation with them around you know people pulling up in cars you know what to do what not to do and in that conversation and and they're at like they're like five and six six and seven or so at the time and i say to them i said if someone pulls up you don't know them they try to get you to come in a car or whatever i want you to start screaming and running this is a stranger i don't know him. jade immediately just said okay dad and kendall had a smirk on his face and I'm asking him, what, what, what are you smirking about? And his response to me was, boys don't scream, only girls scream. And I'm like, Lord, you know, and, and I'm a man who is very, very sensitive to these issues. And so I'm, you know, it, it, what it reminds me of is even as a dad, when you're very sensitive to these issues, it's like a continual process. You send your children out to school and to community. When they come back home, you got to tune them up again. You know, it's over. Because I know I didn't teach them that, but it's right. over and over again. Like, it's, it's no, even now, my, my sons are all men. Uh, but even now, it's a continual process because because of what we're up against. Yeah. Thanks very much. I, I think I think that story uh, of your son. Um, I agree. It does remind us that this is not a one-off process. That this is continual. That parenting is not a one-off process. We're making decisions every day. And as as we think about manhood and 
uh, parenthood, how how does how is that pun no pun intended? How is that colored by how are those experiences of manhood and masculinity colored by an individual's race or or, or ethnicity? So I'll go first. I'll be quick. I think our race and our culture influences how we may see certain areas or situations as safe and 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 not or unsafe. You know, where can this be celebrated? Where can our manhood not be celebrated? And I say that, for example, you know, being a black man, a, a barber shop can often be a safe haven for 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 many folks. Where um, I think of my barber and other barbers, where yeah, that may be the only person that some folks may be able to express their true selves or yeah i see people in barbershops just hanging around probably got their hair cut early in the morning and there to the afternoon because they they feel comfort there and, and, and that's just something that you know i've seen mostly in, in the black community so i think based on our race and our culture it, it may influence how we may or may not feel comfortable expressing and celebrating our manhood I guess I'll share next. Uh, I, I appreciate what Brother Curry is sharing in regards to comfort and safety, and 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 there's the negotiation and the tension points of that uh, with with various notions of, of masculinity. And in the barbershop has always been a safe place for us where we can gather as black men. Now, some of the challenges there, though, we gather as black men, and it becomes a safe haven for us. But how, you know, there's also how we contribute to sexism and, and the perpetration of that and what, 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 what are the conversations in those spaces also become important. I also think about our boys, uh, our black boys and, and, and this urgency, this society, our society has this urgency on them being viewed as men uh, and how we contribute to that within our communities as well. I know I didn't do well with my oldest sons. Uh, my two oldest are, well, all of them are adults now, but my two oldest girls, then, then three boys, and then there's my baby girl, Jade. Uh, but with my two oldest sons, I didn't do well. I mean, I was, a, I was an inner city kid. We grew up in, the in they, they grew up in the inner city. And uh, I taught them a lot of rigid notions of manhood. Uh, and I did not allow them to be boys. Uh, they had to be men quickly. And uh, with my younger son, Kendall, I had the opportunity to pour into him differently, to let him be a big old goofy boy as long as he wanted to be. Uh, to, you know, not to, you know, impose the, these notions of man and that he can ask me for help, that he can always come to me that, you know, and he does, believe me, he does. And uh, even there's sometimes friction between myself and his mother because she, she gets a little concerned about the things he comes to me for instead of coming to her. And, I, and he has his mixed bag of who he goes to for what. Right. Uh, but the, the fact that he, he is wide open to coming to me anytime he needs help, I am okay with that. And I'm not in a rush for that to change. Uh, so that's another thing that resonates for me. And then the last thing is, is the trauma that black men experience, the notion that hurt people hurt people, mm -hmm. experiencing the trauma, the mental health challenges that also couple that and, and the teaching of not asking for help and the, the impact not only that's having on, our, on, you know, on black men, but the impact is having on our communities. Uh, all men experience this, but when you, you couple it with a race construct, you can just see how it, it, it deepens in our experience as Black men. Thank you very much for that. Dr. Cry Coupe, I think you want to see something. Yeah, and I was just going to say that question really makes me think about when we think of social services or even social work training or intervention services, it's often void of conversations around history and really thinking about, as Mr. Porter just said, like that historical trauma or the impacts of intergenerational trauma. A lot of the, in my opinion, um, strict roles or gender norms that we see within our community came out of protective mechanisms or developed as a form of a protective mechanism. So black men have had to 
become men earlier in life in many instances because of the things that were happening in our community in terms of kind of thinking about systemic policies that have negatively impacted our families. One thing that often comes to mind is when we think about families who were receiving uh, welfare and housing support uh, in the 1960s, thinking about the midnight raids that would occur. So child welfare workers or uh, human services workers come into the house unannounced at any time. And if they saw remnants of a man in a woman's home, like her benefits could be taken away. And so in many instances, having families who were together and for whatever reason, didn't necessarily have the ability to fully support that family financially, if you needed that resource, like imagine what it felt like to be a father or a partner in that situation, having to fully remove yourself um, or your likeness from that household in order to make sure that your family ate or that your family was housed, that your family was taken care of. And so when we think about how some of these roles play out, we should not forget the history that has led us to this place um, in those conversations. Yeah. I'm really glad that you brought up the 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 history as well, uh, Dr. Cryer Coupe. Um, and I think just the direction that the conversation is taking uh, kind of forces us to remember how difficult, how challenging it could be to try to tease apart these intersecting identities of black male and fatherhood. But I want us to kind of think a little bit uh, of, we, I think we, we spend a lot of time talking about that male and, or that masculine male and black part. Uh, when you start to overlay that now with another veneer of parenthood, that's, a, that's an additional layer of stress, additional layer of meaning, identity, and all of, all of that kind of comes in together. If you could talk about that for, for, for a couple of minutes. Maybe, maybe we, 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 we could start with you, uh, Tony. Well, I, 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 what I would like to do is uh, just piggyback off of what the doc was just speaking about, and, and it, it'll tie into that in some respect. Because what she made me think about was concentrated poverty, not just poverty, I mean, but concentrated poverty. That, that's an experience that's unique to black and brown people in this society, concentrated poverty. I mean, we have more poor white people than any other group for the obvious reasons, more white people, and we live in a capitalist society, but they don't experience concentrated poverty in the way we do. I grew up in the Bronx, uh, right around the corner from the tenement building that I lived in is Claremont Housing Projects. You know, each building has about a thousand uh, uh, people. Uh, you could put about, and in this particular housing project, there's about, because it's 21 stories high, 10 apartments on the floor, 210 apartments, it's about a thousand people in a building. And here is about 12 buildings in an eight square block radius. That's 12,000 people, 12,000 people living in the eight square block radius and the common denominator amongst them all is that they're financially poor. That, that experience of concentrated poverty uh, is a black and brown experience in the United States of America. And so I think about as a doc was talking about housing and et cetera, that, and, and that's where policing looks completely different than protecting and serving. How you concentrate poverty and, and then the experience, and then the common denominator is everyone is financially poor. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what, what does parenting look like? in those communities for us. You're talking about a community riddled with trauma, right? And, and, and the stresses that come with that. And then for many of us, it's about getting out, right? Because it becomes a place that we view as being infested. So it's about getting out, not so much how do we work together within these communities. The goal many times is getting out. And the human service arena festers on that community. You know, the average family in that community can have six, seven case managers in their lives at one time. And so what is parenting like you know, when we talk, when you mentioned a uh, doc, the stress, you know, uh, of, of parenting as, as a black and brown parent. I, I think about that community specifically because it's a unique experience for black and brown people that white folks don't experience. Uh, even native folks with the reservation in that experience, they're still they're not concentrated, right? And, and, and that's the piece that uh, resonates for me and, and it was part of my experience growing up as a boy. Thank you so much for sharing that, Tony. 
So I, I want, I'll build on that just a few, a little bit, and, and then talk more about my personal experience about that intersection. And I mean, just in that, it, it, it's also, you think of how the media has an impact on the narrative. When it comes to support, you think of a, a, the pandemic that's going on and, and how there's so many narratives between what may be framed as the haves and the have nots and who's deserving of resources, who's deserving of, 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 of different benefits of the community and how even that's just depicted on certain communities and how that may be an impact on, on how they, these folks who, you know, people are people, um, but given where somebody is born, you know, given their color of their skin and given all these other different factors may determine the access that they have to health and well well-being um, and, and what resources they do have and what they don't. Um, for me, when, I, when I'm thinking about me as an individual and how, how that intersects with me, I, I think of personally at me, so with my oldest son who's eight years old, um, I have 50% custody of him where yeah, I'm, I'm his dad 100% of the time, but I only see him 50% of his time. Yeah. So then you think about all these different um, roles and identities that, that, that come into play and, and me just wanting to be a great father, me thinking about, um, you know, one thing that actually uh, Ms. Porter said earlier um, was about how, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but adding on my, my own words too, where at, at typically every day, you know, millions of people release their, their kids to go to school, to go to play and or just to go outside and have fun, but there's often this, this unspoken um, feeling or some, it may even be a deep anxiety that, you know, for, for people of color, for many black folks, they may send their child to school or outside and worry if their child is actually gonna come back home. Mm -hmm. and, and they have to have certain conversations like Mr. Porter said, um, in order to, to re-ensure that their, their children are educated and that they know what the reality is for them just because of the color of their skin. And I, I wrote a piece a while ago called um, Until When that focused on, it's a, 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 a spoken word uh, poem that emphasized, uh, it highlighted the, the lives of, of Emmett Till, Trayvon Martin, um, and, um, and, and, um, and Tamir Rice. Mm -hmm. And what it did was, you know, I, I reflected on, on my son and, and my life and, and, and realized, you know, will my son be the next news story? It wasn't until, the, the, those parents, you know, they were 17, 14, 12, you know, around those ages where they may not have thought until then that their child would be the next news story. I wonder if mine will be next. So it's some of it, it, it's, it's those specific types of conversations, those thoughts, those feelings that impacts who you are and how you identify as, as being black, as being a man, as being a father, as so it, it all comes into play of how we navigate and how we just view everyday life. And, and in many cases, it's often a weight that we carry. Um, the last thing I'll say is that it's not like this can be turned off. You know, I, I, I've spoken to many folks when they're just like, this at the height of the, uh, of the, the, the racial uprising, um, you know, last year, you know, with the deaths of, of, of George Floyd, of Breonna Taylor, of so many folks that look like me, you know, my kids are looking at me and they're, and they're seeing these folks on TV who look like their dad, who lives are being taken and you can't help but think wow i wonder what type of fears is, is are being put in my my, my child's my, their minds what type of seeds are being planted about their father and also when they grow up and it's not as simple as i've heard people oh you know if it gets too stressful for you turn off the news just watch and i'm like what <laughs> if i turn off the news it doesn't it doesn't stop the feeling that my people are being killed every single day so uh, you know i just i just wanted to, to, to share that because that's just something i feel really strongly mm -hmm. about when it comes to those intersecting identities yeah. so i i i know that you're you're about to, to to comment on that i want to overlay an additional layer of complexity to your answer uh, dr cryer coupe so again thinking of of that intersection of black male uh and parent um thinking also of that socio-political system that's stacked against black men that uh, both mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Cooper, uh, Mr. Curry and Mr. Porter were talking about, thinking also of that uh, social system that sometimes encourages and rewards toxic mm -hmm. or unhealthy masculinity and an economic system that's kind of inimical to families. How can and how do black fathers effectively negotiate 
these intersections of their identities and what happens when they cannot. Yeah. Um, so I, I, it kind of feel, fills into that, that same conversation. That is a lot, but it reminds me of an interview. Um, our lab published a paper last year and we titled it based on a quote that a dad said to us. And he essentially said, you receive more training to drive a car than you do to parent. So when you think about the role of father, if we start with that identity um, in society, a lot of dads that we've talked to in our work said that they didn't feel prepared stepping into the role. And so I like that Mr. Porter talked about how he was a different dad for the children he had earlier in life or you know their older children than he was for you know uh, the Kendall and, and Jade later on and so I think that in terms of being able to effectively navigate some of these systems barriers relationships things of that nature like understanding that parenting roles evolve so dads may not always feel efficacious early on or there may be times when you are feeling like you know I've got this and then something happens and kind of knocks you off your block in terms of whether or not you're making the right decision any parent can tell you wake up every day some days it's going well some days it's not my dad often likes to say you know every day is not easy um, in terms of thinking about that and I like that your question now complicates this experience because when we think about social class I think class plays a lot um, in terms of like how black dads show up so I grew up on the south side of Chicago in the 80s and right prior to the time of my coming of age there were several black professionals that lived in my neighborhood. Um, but as we transitioned as a society and you know, folks in the community became more upwardly mobile and the suburbs opened up as an actual option for families to move to, we started to see um, so public service workers moving out of the community. So whereas when my mom grew up in that very same building, there were doctors, there were dentists, there was a, you know, a postal worker on the block. By the time I came to age, that was not the case. And so, in my own personal experience, I began to see a divide in terms of like what parenting looked like and what certain segments of the population were preparing their children for versus what other segments of the population were preparing their children for. So as I think about the experiences of Black dads, I think we need to, um, even in the research community, begin to intersect or interject more of a class analysis in um, our discussions of what Black fatherhood looks like. Um, and so one of the questions we often ask at the beginning of our qualitative interviews is for dads to say, well, what does it mean to be a father? How do you define that? And so oftentimes we will hear the, you know, a provider, a disciplinarian. Um, now more so we're beginning to hear, you know, the words like a nurturer, someone to, to have fun with and things of that nature. Um, and I like that we're now beginning to have more of those conversations so that we see these roles in totality, but that we're also able to segment different parts of the experience to be able to best support healthy and whole families as, as much as possible. I'll leave it open to, to both you, uh, Mr. Curry and Mr. Porter, if you want to add anything to that. The thing that was resonating or in my soul was, uh, you know, where, in, in quest to teach, to teach our black boys to be their authentic selves, to enjoy their life, to, you know, we, we do that at bumping up against the tension points of survival, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, and, and I, I know y'all sons are younger and this is coming to you and, or you're having a taste of it. I, you know, I can think of it with my son, particularly Kendall in middle school and high school you know, uh, Trayvon Martin being murdered. And mm -hmm. now I'm, I'm talking to Kendall about not walking too slow, not walking too fast, not running. It's like, what the hell? When can he run? When can he stand still? When can he stroll, right? At 16, he's driving. I give him an old beat up uh, SUV that I had. And at that time, you're supposed to be kind of excited. I'm nervous teaching them 10 and two hands on the stereo, on the steering wheel, you know, how to talk to police, how not to talk to police. He has friends that are white, that are Latin, that are, you know, Asian, you know, his whole crew is uh, like the United Nations, but happened to teach him that he can't say what other boys say. You know, uh, if you're in an encounter with police and you're sitting and you're, you're one of your white buddies is there with you, they may be running off the mouth. You can't do that. You are yes, sir. No, sir. You know, so just teaching our boys, you know, there was a, a man that was murdered in our community or my daughters. My oldest daughter lives here in Charlotte with me, her community. We heard the story about a boy from FAMU, I believe, 
Mm. And his car broke down. He knocked on the door. The woman quick opened the door, seen him, slammed the door, called the police. He sees the police. He thinks they're there to help him. He's running to the police and the police murder him. Yeah. Now I'm talking to Kendall about if you have to knock on the door, knock and step way back, you know, mm. trying to help my son to negotiate the fact that society still views you as a threat, even while yeah. being a boy. And how to negotiate that and, and still live your authentic self and the freedoms and everything that's afforded to you. Uh, that's a hell of a job that, that we have that we have to do and, and negotiate a, as parents. And it's painful as hell. My kids know not to call me after nine o'clock at night just to say, hey, what's up there? I don't want that. Call me in the morning. Don't call me after nine just to chit chat because. The way my heart races when that phone rings, I just, if, if, just don't, I don't want to experience that. And, and you know, and, and they understand that and, and they don't. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that to me. Yeah, that, that really hits me really hard. Again, with my kids being nine years old and, and younger and think about conversations that I, I have with them now you know, being under 10 years old and conversations I'm going to have when they're able to drive or when they're able to have more autonomy over what they do in life. And I, you know, just from what you're saying, uh, Mr. Porter, I, I think awareness is so key because before they can negotiate the identities or we can negotiate, we have to have an understanding that they exist. Yes. And so as fathers, that's something that I, I think is so critical for us, us to do one way or another to, uh, to, to let uh, our, our kids know that unfortunately the world may treat you differently just because of the color of your skin. And it is messed up, but is a reality of, of, of our society. And, and depending on where they grow up, depending on you know, their, 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 their socioeconomic status, it may be in their face, or it may not be. Now, I, I, I grew up in, in, in North New Jersey in, in, the, in, the, um, in, the, in the in the early 90s. And you know, it was very different than what it is now. But it, it was it was a place where if you were a person, if you were a, bl a black child, based off the school systems, based off of the environment and, and who you're exposed to, it was autumn, it was an automatic ceiling that most knew that this is, this is the life you're gonna live. You should not even think about pursuing something above this because this is who you are. You're gonna be in the streets. You're gonna do this, you're gonna do that. Maybe you'll graduate high school. Uh, and you know, so, so it's, it's, it's these different, even, even the identities <laughs> before you, you know, as a person growing up, it, it may have felt as though it was already chosen for you. And that's not the case and, and it shouldn't be the case. And I say that because, you know, you take, I think about me and my experiences growing up in that, in, in, in that area or others who, who may be black dads who may raise them kids in other areas and maybe more fluid areas. And just because they're the way they brought up is different. If they see, if, if they encounter certain situations where another person only sees the color of their skin, they're not going to have a time to explain who their parents are, what, what colleges they, they, they went to, you know, you know, how they're connected the first thing people see is the color of your skin. And, and, and often, unfortunately, in many cases, decisions are made before they're even words spoken. So having that awareness and sharing that awareness so that we as Black dads and also our kids can understand and then be able to negotiate some of these identities, I, I, I think that's, that's it's, it's extremely critical, not only to, the, to, to, to them being aware of how they make decisions based off of their, their, their values and beliefs, but also it, it pains me to say it, but, but truly the, the, the survival of, of, of ourselves and, and, and our kids as well. Excellent. I think that's a really great ending point for our conversation. Um, I want to really thank you for an enlightening discussion. Um, and as we close, I want each of you to, to spend about a minute or two um, just giving a word or some kind of takeaway message or practical advice, especially for Black fathers. What kind of practical advice or takeaway 
would you uh, offer to black fathers who are listening to this podcast? We'll, 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 we'll start with uh, Dr. Cryer Coupe, go around to Tony and come down to uh, Dwayne Curry. Okay, so I'll end by just speaking as a black daughter. One thing that I've appreciated the most about my relationship with my dad as I've aged is the ability to sit and ask questions and have discussions similar to what we've had here today. And I like that he has been open enough to show up as his whole self and that has influenced the work that I'm, I'm doing in terms of thinking about, you know, my dad as a provider, my dad as a nurturer, my dad as a partner, my dad as a brother, as a, a cousin, an uncle. Um, there are many hats that you wear in your role as a black father and your child sees many of them. And so just be open um, and don't forget Get joy, don't forget healing. Like we do live in a space of trauma and we know historically um, black fathers have been demonized and traumatized, but you survived. You're here today and there's opportunity each day to continue to live in a space of joy. Thank you very much. Gr growing up as a, a boy, my father was very, very present in my life, uh, but he focused primarily on being a provider. I know he cared about me. I know he loved me, but he didn't, those are things he did not say. My father, uh, I don't recall ever telling me that he loved me, mm -hmm. even though I know he cared about me greatly. I know he loved me. Uh, he demonstrated it, but it was not something that he would share. So I think it's very, very, and, and, and that comes back to his relationship with rigid notions of manhood. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I believe it's very important for us as fathers, as black men, uh, to really talk about love, with not only with our girls, but with our boys, to tell our sons we love them, to talk about, to talk with them from an emotional place, you know, to talk about feelings, to talk about sadness, to talk about fear, to talk about joy, and to, and to make the word love a common word uh, amongst us that we share, to hug your sons and not just the dap up kind of hug that we do as black men, but a real, real hug, you know, to hold him, tell him in his ear while you're holding him, how much you love him, how, how proud you are of him, how important he is to your life. I think these are experiences that, that will serve our black boys as they negotiate uh, these norms that society have out there are not necessarily in our favor. Thank you very much, Mr. Porter and Mr. Curry. Yeah, well, what I'd say is, is to, to be present and whatever that means for you, you may have your child 100% of the time, maybe 50% of the time, maybe every other weekend, but be present and, and let your child know that you're there. Um, you know, there, there, there may be situations where there may be another father or stepfather involved in the situation, but no one can replace a, a father and especially a, a dad. Anyone could be a father, but not everyone could be a dad. Uh, and the second thing I would say is to, to be the father, to be the parent, the dad that your kids need. It may not only be that disciplinarian or, or the person that is the, the provider or, or all these other roles, but your child may need someone who can just listen and can just understand. The child may need someone they can cry to and cry on. Be whoever your child needs you to be. And that's, that's, that's a role that can be played and it should be played. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Curry. Um, so thanks again, everybody, for your time, for your experience, for your expertise. Uh, today we had with us, uh, Mr. Dwayne Curry, we had uh, Dr. Uh, Kia, Kiana Cryer Coupe, and Mr. Tony Porter sharing really, really great gems and uh, drops of wisdom with us. Um, I think for me, a, a really interesting takeaway was that this notion of a developmental and, and dynamic perspective to how we see these different identities that men, that black men hold as, as fathers, as men, as black, that that can change over time, over a period of time, as you go into these different stages in your life. Um, it's both developmental and dynamic. Um, uh, we don't see a lot of black, we don't see or hear a lot of, about black fathers in the literature, but that's emerging as Dr. Kraya Kupi uh, mentioned to us, that that's, that that's that's changing and we want to continue to have these conversations around what it means for men to be black fathers uh validating them elevating them 
uh, educating them and allowing them to take the spaces to, to visibly live in those spaces that often our society seems to be blinded to. So thank you very much again. It was a really great conversation and I look forward to remaining in touch with all of you. Thank you very much.